Last year, some idiot made a video titled Tofu Katara, Strong Female Characters Done Right. In this atrocious video essay, he posited that the female leads of Avatar The Last Airbender are two shining examples of how to display femininity through two drastically different yet wonderfully and lovingly crafted characters. This moron believed that their compassion, caring, patience, persistence, passion, and hopefulness, not simply their ability to throw natural elements at bad guys, was what made them much-needed paradigms of powerful feminine virtue in the modern world of entertainment. Well, thankfully, Netflix came along to show that simpleton what a true strong woman should be like. Alright, that's enough of this sarcasm shtick. I can't have that be my whole identity. It truly is remarkable how Hollywood manages to mangle female characters time and time again. Oh, they get it at least somewhat right every once in a while. Most recently, Mizu from Blue-Eyed Samurai, despite her incredible power, is actually done quite well. But the majority of major releases featuring a woman of some skill or ability continue to go down the same route, writing characters whose central arc is that of self-actualization, whose struggles are dwarfed by their natural talent, and who can win the day by just being themselves and not holding back. What's incredibly depressing about many of these stories is not just that they follow the same inane blueprint, but also that they manage to mangle the unique, carefully constructed arc of the original character and make her worse in every possible way. Call me impossibly optimistic, but I was beginning to think that maybe we were growing out of this phase, that the industry realized that these sorts of character arcs are wildly unpopular with audiences that the writers had finally decided to inject some life into the dull, wooden, self-fulfilling girl bosses that plagued the late 2010s. If any show were to break that mold, surely it would be the adaptation of the masterpiece that is Avatar The Last Airbender. Surely Netflix would see the brilliance of the original and maintain the depth of its characters who form the very heart of that incredible story. Well, it didn't. Now, Katara is hardly the only character to which Netflix did a grave disservice. Almost every character in the adaptation acts like they're doing a half-hearted job of trying to keep Ko from stealing their face. And even those actors who manage to rise above the incredibly mediocre script have their characters severely downgraded from their original form. But someone had to be first on the chopping block, and since I'm a chivalrous sort of fellow, I say ladies first, and so we begin with Katara. Or, that is, the simulacrum of Katara that completely misses the mark set by her animated counterpart. The first hint that 2024 Katara would lack some key character elements comes at the very beginning with the opening voiceover, which lacks the iconic line, but I believe, Aang can save the world, and doesn't actually seem to be given by Katara at all. And yes, I know that the opening monologue in the first episode of the original doesn't have that line, but it expresses the same sentiment of hope that is absolutely crucial to Katara as a character. Despite that, the first new episode does give us the sense that it understands the importance of Katara's relentless hopefulness, as she tells Sokka, That's what the Avatar is, he's hope, and people need that just as much as they do food and shelter. This unyielding belief that you can make a difference, no matter the odds, if you simply try to help people in need is what makes Katara Katara. It enables her to be the beating heart of Team Avatar, to be the glue that holds them together when they're on the brink of collapse. So it was encouraging to hear her express this sentiment so early on. The problem, however, is that it almost never comes up again in the following six plus hours of runtime. The only other time we get any sort of speech about hope comes in the Spirit World episode, where Netflix simply copies and pastes Katara's original line about new life coming out of death. Beyond that, the overly emotional Katara who can't help but make weepy speeches about hope just isn't there. A fact which highlights the real issue with Netflix's Katara, which demonstrates why she is a failure of femininity, she just isn't much of anything. Low-resolution Katara doesn't just fail in her femininity because she's not as motherly, or because her romantic relationship with Aang is nuked from orbit, or because she doesn't mend Sokka's pants. After all, femininity cannot be constrained to a certain set of behaviors or practices, it is simply about living virtuously as a woman. So we must ask the question then, is carbon copy Katara virtuous? Well, no, not really. That's not to say that she's a bad person, or that she's swimming in vices, she's a modern heroine, of course she isn't, but rather that the virtues of compassion, affection, trust, ardor, and of course hope, which defined Katara, simply are not present. They are stripped away almost completely, leaving imitation Katara hollow, shallow, and lacking meaningful character work. 
her failure as a character, as a woman, is not so much defined by what Netflix did with her arc as it is by what they didn't do. Katara's relationship with Aang reduced to the level of buddies who do stuff together. She's not the one to pull him out of the Avatar state at the Southern Air Temple. Sokka accompanies her through the Cave of Two Lovers. Yeah, that's in the first season now. There's simply nothing beyond them just kind of hanging out and going on their trip together. All the fun interpersonal dialogue that takes place in the original is nowhere to be found here. The show just assumes that because they're doing things together, they care about each other in some vague, friend-like way. Remember how Katara gave an incredibly idealistic and overly optimistic speech to the imprisoned Earthbenders, sure that her words would drive them to fight for their freedom, and then, when that failed, had to temper her relentless sense of hope with some realism and practicality in order to make things work out? Yeah, that's just not here. You know how Katara became totally smitten with and completely trusted Jet, this suave, dashing freedom fighter who is as good with people as he is with his swords, and how the discovery that he was in fact quite the monster deeply disturbed her? How the betrayal of her trust left a lasting wound because of her great capacity to care and love? Nah, now she just finds out he's a terrorist, snarks him a little bit, and goes on her merry way without a second thought. So what does that leave us? What remnant of Katara's personality is there left to work with? Well, pretty much one thing and one thing only. Her bending. Xerox Katara's entire character arc is just her learning how to be a master waterbender. But not just that, she has to be a fighter. Of course, the original handles this subject as well, but we'll get to that comparison later. Right from the start, clone Katara proudly proclaims to Aang, I'm a warrior. This is despite the fact that she literally just told Sokka not everything is about preparing to fight. But that was for his character arc, not hers, so there's obviously no need for her to be consistent. And oh, you best believe we'll be talking about how they massacred my boy Sokka. But getting back to Temu Katara, who is now arguing with Sokka about whether or not they should go with Aang or return to the Southern Water Tribe, I refuse to call it Wolf Cove. Her argument that they need to help the Avatar save the world doesn't sway her older brother, but you know what does? Her declaration that it's about more than just helping Aang. That is to say, it's about her. Before Aang showed up, she couldn't bend worth a darn, but now, thanks to a couple of pointers about energy that he gave her, she can do all sorts of water bending. I can't go back, is her definitive statement. And that is how she wins the argument. That is why Sokka accompanies her on this journey, because Wish.com Katara needs to be able to water bend. Naturally, Katara learning to water bend is a significant part of her character in Book 1. However, learning a skill is not the most interesting character work. How they learn that skill is far more compelling. The challenges that characters have to overcome and the sacrifices they have to make are the key elements of such a journey. Such struggles were how Katara displayed her growth in virtuous femininity, as she fought through her self-doubt and learned to temper her wildly optimistic expectations with practicality. Remember how Aang was a naturally talented waterbender while Katara struggled to get the form correctly? Remember how that deeply frustrated her? And remember how she then surpassed Aang in skill because she refused to let that frustration stand in her way and worked far harder than her airheaded counterpart? It's hard to forget, assuming you've seen the original show, it's a pretty crucial character point for both Katara and Aang. Well, to nobody's surprise, it's gone here. Netflix took that scene and then just gave impressionist Katara the natural talent. Aang even tells her as much. You're a natural, he says. You're a real waterbender, Katara. Now, it's not necessarily a problem for someone to be naturally good at something, or even fully self-taught to the level of mastery in that discipline. But if they are, and they don't really struggle as Katara is now not struggling, then there needs to be something else with which they struggle. There needs to be other character work happening. And for Clarence Isle Katara, there simply is nothing else going on. She's learning to bend, that's her entire character arc. And while becoming proficient at waterbending did really matter to Katara, her journey was given more flavor and depth by the presentation of Aang as naturally skillful, a fact that annoyed Katara, yet did not prevent her from ultimately becoming his teacher. Why cut that out? It just takes away from both characters. It gives facsimile Aang less maturity to gain as he no longer has to overcome the laziness associated with natural talent, and it makes knockoff Katara far less perseverant because she doesn't have that example of skill toward which she must work. However, it wouldn't be fair for me to say that she doesn't struggle at all with waterbending. When trying to figure out the water whip, mimic Katara can't quite get it right, and when Aang tells her to tap into her emotions, she flashes back to her mother dying and fails even more spectacularly. This comes up again when she's talking with Jet, who reveals that my mother was the fighter in my family because of course she was, 
and parody Katara mentions how the thoughts of the night her mother died have been coming back to her, and I think it's been affecting my bending. Jet tells her that you have to use everything inside you to help you fight, and asks her to remember what Kaya was like before she died. Upon doing so, Erzat's Katara can now whip water with the best of them. On the face of it, this isn't bad. Finding healing by remembering how your deceased mother loved you, how she found joy in the sunrise and the little things of life makes some passable sense. The problem, once again, lies not so much in what this scene is, but rather in what it isn't. What did it mean for Katara to lose her mother? It meant that she, despite being younger, had to essentially become Sokka's mother, had to raise her older brother, that she had to take on duties within their home and their village far beyond those typical for her age. It forced her to mature far faster than normal. It caused her to lose much of the innocence and carefreeness inherent in childhood. It drove her to be protective and cautious even to a fault. In other words, it had a deep and lasting impact on Katara, shaping the very nature of her personality, motivations, and fears. But for kinda Katara, her mother's death is really only important because it relates to her bending. Because her bending and her desire to be a warrior bender is the only significant consistent character trait present in this poor imitation of our favorite loopy-haired heroine. In the first episode, as mentioned, she tells Aang, I'm a warrior, despite having no training or actual waterbending ability at that point. In the second episode, she reads Grandma Exposition's scroll, which tells her, you are a waterbender. That's who you have always been. In the third episode, Jet tells her, I had a feeling you knew how to handle yourself, because fighting prowess is absolutely the first thing that comes to you when looking at this small child. In the fourth episode, Katara discovers Jet's terrorist ways and confronts him and then freezes him, causing him to say, look at the power you have. That's because of me. But oh no, we can't have that be true. Katara must be self-made. That wasn't you, that was me. Even though she later tells Sokka, Jet, he helped me through some things. Now, this could work as an admission that her earlier statement to Jet was in fact just her pride, her not wanting to admit that the boy she now despises could have helped her, but it's never built upon beyond this one line, which is a missed opportunity to, you know, do some actual character work. In the fifth episode, Katara single-handedly sends an entire squad of firebenders flying without impaling any of them because this is still a kid's show. And Aang, of course, notes how she is inventing new moves. That's the mark of a skilled bender. And then when we flash back to the day Katara's mother dies, Kaya tells her, Someday you will show the world just how powerful you are. And oh my goodness, can we please not. I mean, you are one iteration from literally just saying, I am woman, hear me roar. And look, Katara wanting to be a skilled waterbender and wanting to be able to fight to protect her home and her friends is not a bad thing. It is in fact a very good thing, but it cannot be everything. Aang's entire character arc is not just learning the three other elements so he can save the world. It's also about freedom, maturity, responsibility, guilt, and the importance of one's fastly held beliefs. And those elements give his arc depth. This show understands that to a degree. It didn't do the best job with Aang, and much of what makes him a beloved character has been stripped away, but at least there is an attempt to have him work through his guilt and the weight of his duties separate from his training in the bending arts, which this season just doesn't include for some unfathomable reason. When the focus of a character is on her power, she becomes hardly a character at all. She's basically just a weapon. Team Avatar uses Katara. It's super effective. Is that what we want from our heroines? That they're just swords to be wielded by the story to cut down bad guys? And yes, Simulation Katara is fighting the bad guys, is in fact on the right side, but her attention is so inward focused that it hardly matters. Remember how Katara just wanted the Earthbenders to rise up and fight, even if she could hardly bend a bubble at that time? Remember when Katara urged Aang to enter the sanctuary at Roku's temple, even though it meant sacrificing her freedom and maybe her life? Remember when Katara defended Aang's honor in the storm, only to find out that his story was more complex than she realized? but then encouraged him nonetheless, assuring Aang that it was meant to be. That if he had stayed, he would have been killed along with the rest of the Southern Air Temple. Side note, Netflix gave that line and a lot of Katara's relationship with Aang to Monk Gyatso, in case you needed further proof that they intentionally downplayed Katara and Aang's relationship. They knew Aang needed to be encouraged and consoled, but we couldn't have Captain Katara doing that because that would distract her from bending. All of that to say, Katara does a lot, a lot of important, noteworthy, impactful stuff without having to waterbend one drop. I ask you, what is a better example of strong, beautiful femininity? A heroine who can throw some H2O around, or one who can motivate, inspire, and build up others while simultaneously learning how to become whole herself? The answer, of course, is someone who can do both. Yes, Nottara ostensibly wants to be able to bend to protect those who cannot protect themselves, 
but there's so little relationship building and so much me waterbender, you see, talk that any sense of self-gift or self-sacrifice gets drowned out. But let's talk about that both thing. Because yes, of course the real Katar does in fact very much care about being able to waterbend. She goes to great lengths to acquire the waterbending scroll, which is a far more creative and interesting way to show how much Katara wants to learn waterbending than just having her tell us I'm a warrior and having Grandma Exposition tell her that she has always been a waterbender. So naturally, when Paku refuses to train Katara upon Team Avatar's arrival at the Northern Water Tribe, she is mildly perturbed to say the least. However, you may recall, despite her frustrations with the North's stodgy customs and her personal irritation with Master Paku, Katara still wants Aang to train under him. This is, naturally, because she recognizes that there are far more important things at stake here than her own ability to master waterbending. The Avatar learning all four elements is the paramount mission of Team Avatar, and so she encourages Aang to learn from Paku, even if he is a big jerk. Once again, that element of the story is simply not present in the Netflix show. As mentioned, Aang doesn't waterbend. Ever. And Buck 99 Katara only ever makes one half-hearted attempt to get him to try. So Netflix Paku isn't for Netflix Aang, he's for Netflix Katara. Because everything in relation to her is for the purpose of getting her to waterbend. And the writers weren't satisfied with Paku merely upholding the tribe's customs. They had to make it personal. You're not strong enough. Women aren't strong enough, he tells her. Yeah, um... That's a stupid argument, and the original show doesn't have him make it for a reason. These are basically magical powers. Even an old coot like Paku would recognize that physical strength has very little to do with the actual ability to fight, especially since he is a master of waterbending, an art defined by using the strength of one's opponent against him. You could make all sorts of suggestions as to why the Northern Water Tribe only trains men to fight. You could suggest that men are naturally more aggressive or more naturally protective, that keeping the women away from the front lines is an honorable thing to do, but whether you believe that or not isn't really relevant. Broad rules like men fight, women heal can be generally helpful, but exceptions can and should be made when necessary. All benders, one might say, should have the freedom to do their duty. Katara's duty in both the original and the knockoff is to protect and train Aang. So yes, she is right. She should be allowed to train under Paku. Should be allowed to stand against the firebenders in combat. However, just because you're right about one thing doesn't sanctify all your other related arguments. Hoax Katara tells Sokka, All my life I'd held myself back, and I'm not going to let someone else do it now. Which isn't true. You could say that Grandma Exposition held her back by not giving her the waterbending scroll, but we have seen no evidence that Katara herself ever reigned in her bending abilities for any reason whatsoever. The first time we see her, she is practicing waterbending, and then she immediately proceeds to argue with Sokka about the value of said art. There is no reason to inject this line into the story other than to paint Katara as a self-made, self-actualizing girl boss whose entire character arc revolves around her ability to do a thing. What a waste. Ah, but we still have her duel with Paku. What will Netflix do? Will they actually let their Katara lose? Well, yes, it turns out the writers were smart enough to not change that element of the story, realizing that it would probably anger a lot of fans, even though they think we somehow wouldn't notice everything else they stripped away from her character. However, they altered the tone of the fight and its narrative impact significantly, all to suit robot Katara's so-called character development. First, after losing, she asks Paku, but you still won't let me fight? And he affirms that. Well, wait, hold up, fight. Not train, fight. Not only is this contrary to the narrative given by the original show, where Katara needed a master to train her, it contradicts this show, where Katara very clearly states her need and desire to train under the masters of the Northern Water Tribe. She even goes into detail about what aspects of her bending she thinks need improvement. But I guess we've forgotten about all that because Katara is enough for Katara. Second, of course, everyone just congratulates her for losing impressively, so it's basically like she didn't lose at all. Because we can't really have Katara lose. Third, remember how Paku, after having won the fight, sees Katara's necklace and recognizes it as the one he carved for his betrothed, a woman he loved, but one who left for the South Pole in rejection of the North's rigid customs. Remember how recalling that painful memory caused him to recognize that his inflexible ways should bend a little, and so he agrees to train Katara along with Aang. Yeah, that's not here either. Okay, well, why not? Easy. If Paku came to that realization about their customs through the memory of his past lost love, that would mean that Katara wasn't the one to change his mind, and they needed Katara to be the one to change his mind. And so, on the very brink of battle, Katara goes to even the odds, 
and then approaches Master Paku stating, you know we can make a difference. And by we, she of course means all the women of the tribe. That's right, Katara has brought to the front line of battle dozens of women whose only ability waterbending wise is healing. I don't need to go into detail as to why this is a terrible plan, right? We all understand that these women are going to be massacred because they have absolutely no idea what to do. Unless, of course, they've all just been practicing in secret all these years, or Katara gave a brief PowerPoint presentation based off her scroll that conveniently enabled all the women to instantly learn the martial arts side of waterbending. But who cares about logical consistency? This is about Katara proving to the big bad man that girls can fight too. Nothing shall stand in her way. Again, Katara is right and Paku is wrong. This is established in the original show. But while that story handled the resolution of this conflict with some tact and added depth to Paku's character in the meanwhile, the adaptation just has Katara beat him over the head until he yields. No surprise there, really. The show is ham-fisted and heavy-handed in practically all its storytelling. Would you like proof? Surely you don't need more, but in the spirit of ham-fistedness, I'm giving you more. Remember the iconic line of Zuko's, you little peasant. You've found a master, haven't you? Well, to my unironic delight, that line finds its way into the adaptation. But of course, Paku didn't actually train Simulacrum Katara. He just let her fight. So what will Katara say to Zuko's inquiry? You're looking at her. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I rest my case. Netflix Katara is a waterbender. That's it. That's all she is. That is her entire character. Oh, there are the occasional lines tossed in there to try and give her something else, like at the end of the season when she tells Avatar Rage Monster Aang, I need you. But those moments just serve to remind us of how underdeveloped her character has been throughout the show. Does she need Aang? Why? Sure, in the first episode, she proclaimed that the Avatar is hope and she needs hope, but where has that been for the past six plus hours of runtime? The sentiment wasn't built upon in the slightest. Katara spends the majority of most episodes away from Aang, She's with Jet outside Omashu, with Sokka in the Cave of Two Lovers, by herself in the spirit world, not in masks at all, and mostly with Paku at the North Pole. And the scenes they do have together, they're mostly just in them together. They have one or two lip service bonding scenes that do very little to actually establish their relationship, and practically nothing to suggest that Katara needed Aang for anything more than jump-starting her waterbending battery. This moment isn't a bad one in a vacuum. Katara should need Aang and Aang should respond to Katara's need for him. The problem is, this moment doesn't exist in a vacuum. It occurs within the context of a show that has done next to nothing to develop the relationship the writers now want you to believe exists. Because they recognize just how important said relationship is for the narrative, despite the fact that they've ignored it entirely for 95% of the show. At its core, femininity is relational. That's not to say that masculinity isn't, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. This is because the virtues necessary for true, genuine femininity enable one to relate properly to others. Katara displays many such virtues, some established, some still developing throughout the original show. Compassion, perseverance, selflessness, patience, understanding, and hopefulness are all core parts of who Katara is. They give her character depth. They make her feel real. Netflix Katara feels like a cookie-cutter girl boss from 2019. She has been stripped of those virtues that defined her save for a mild sprinkling here and there, and left only with her skill and combat ability as her defining character traits, the attainment of said skill as her only character growth, and the realization that she is her own master as the fulfillment of her character arc. What a waste. 